So we thought we'd do a bit of a series for old gold racing on racing families. And where better to start than my own family? Quite convenient, just down the road. Uh, extended family, we've got dog uh, Jessie here. We've got several cats that'll probably inter uh, interrupt us a few times. And there were some lovely yearlings out in the field there, just beyond the ha-ha, so hopefully they'll come and join us. But this is obviously my dad, Luca, my mum, Sarah. Brother Matthew lives in Australia training racehorses there, so we haven't got him, unfortunately. But I think it'd be really interesting for everyone to get to know you guys a bit better in the sense of uh, how did everything start? Obviously, being Italian, you found yourself in England and at the end of a very successful training career. Let's go right back to the beginning. How did it all start? Well, I didn't find myself in England. It's not as though I was, <laughs> <laughs> as the, I was uh, um, parachuted into England. No, I, I made a deliberate choice to come to England because uh, English racing, I've always adored English racing and I adored the, um, the whole thing about English racing and the race courses and, and the spectacle. And so when I was about uh, 21, 22, I was, still, I was still at university and I got this amazing chance. I was offered a job as pupil assistant with Henry Cecil by Henry himself. And so I had to convince my parents then that it was a good idea to stop un university and come and, come and work in, uh, in England. And uh, it wasn't easy, it wasn't easy. My mother, my mother was in tears, the idea that her only son would be so far away in those days, you know, there was only one flight a day between Milan and London. So it seemed like the same distance as there is now between here and the moon. And, um, and so I came, started working for Henry for, and I worked for him for three years. And then I took the plunge. I had enough people that said to me, if you, if you start training, I'll, I'll give you a horse. And I added them all up and the promises came to about 45 horses. And wow. the day came start. that I started, those 45 horses became eight. <laughs> <laughs> as, as everybody knows, promise of one thing, <laughs> yeah. reality is a different thing. But anyway, I was lucky it started with eight. That soon became 12, and uh, then we started very well. We were lucky with winners from, from a very early stage. But and your first uh, winner was a, was a group winner, wasn't it? That's right, first winner. What? Yeah, it was, was the... First runner, first winner. First runner? No, 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 first, no. first no. runner. First winner, first, first winner, winner. Was, was in the Duke of York, at Oxford York. Oh, yeah. And, um, and then it snowballed from there. And when I started, I just said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll have a go. And worst comes to the worst, I can always go back to Italy. But luckily, I'm still here. But it wasn't completely out of the blue, because you did grow up in a racing family. Oh, yeah. My father was a trainer. My father trained for many, many years, and he was very, very successful. He was champion trainers for 10 years running in Italy. And my mother was a very, very, very good rider. And she was, uh, she was a champion lady rider on the flat and over jumps in Italy. And were either of them bred into it? No, neither of them had anything to do with it. But my father, when, when his father died, unbeknownst to all his, uh, my father and to his uh, brothers and sisters, my grandfather had a string of racehorses. No one knew about them? Nobody knew about it. <laughs> <laughs> at least Definitely knew. not they the wife. They, they, they didn't participate. They didn't, okay. they, they, they didn't seem interested. My father, when his father died, my father was only 18. And, uh, and so he, because his older brothers and all, grown up and departed, and not departed, and moved on. <laughs> <laughs> Cut that. <laughs> uh, his, his other brothers, and, uh, brothers and sisters, were much older and they all, all moved on. My father was uh, left with uh, sorting out when his father died, when, what, what, the, what it was. And, um, and he found this small string of racers, four, four or five, I think. So he started taking an interest. He started going, watching them run, watching them train. And like most owners, um, he then decided he could do a better job than the <laughs> trainer and stay started the trainer. Luckily, he, like, unlike most owners, luckily he knew what he was doing and became successful. <laughs> and your mother also had no previous uh, attachment to horses, no, did she? she? She had never sat on a horse until the age of, uh, I think, 20 or so when she married my father. And, uh, and because of my father, in, 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 Nathan, beginning of interest in racing, so she thought she better she better get used to it and better get close to it. And her way of uh, of trying to to get in was to start riding. So she went to riding school. She did uh, she she learned from there and progressed to riding in uh, show jumping, a bit of show jumping and eventing, and then into race riding. Wow! And became leading amateur rider flat and jumps, wasn't it? And jump, yeah. 
Gosh, yeah, she was a remarkable woman, super elegant also, or only ever wore Georgia Armani and drove around in an Audi TT. This was like well into her 80s. She, she was amazing. She had a handicap place in the back of the car. <laughs> yeah. Handicap sticker. <laughs> the and blue badge the, sticker. The blue badge. The blue <laughs> badge. Going, going 180 kilometres an hour on the motorway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, she was amazing. Yeah. And where did you join the story, Mother? Well, I joined the story because I was working for the British Bloodstock Agency in London. Because in those days, you used to have, you didn't have sort of individual agents. You had an agency and they had, it was an umbrella Hello. situation. And I, in that agency, they had individual agents. And they were based in London. Most agencies, most bloodstock agents then were based in London. And I was loving the idea of riding racehorses in Newmarket. And the agency, we used to get sent to Newmarket for the sales. And we'd stay in a house in Newmarket and help everything with the sales. But all I really wanted to do was to ride out. And I think I rode out once for Henry Cecil. And then at a, a drinks party that the BBA had, I met this dashing young Italian. But we don't need to go into all that story. Oh, no, 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 this is his favourite story. Go on. Not, no, go on. <laughs> so we, there was a drinks party and, uh, and um, Robin Hastings was there. <laughs> was the chairman of the BBA at the time, so, and I saw this gorgeous looking girl, and I said to Robin, can you introduce me to that girl over there? And he said, yes, of course. So we walked over to Sarah, and she's standing there looking beautiful with a gin and tonic in one hand and a fag in the other. <laughs> and uh, Robin said, uh, uh, look, this is Sarah Plunkett, and Sarah, this is Luca Kumani. He comes from Italy. So Sarah looked me up and down and said, hmm, you're an immigrant. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this, this is not going very well. I think it's he he thought start. I had images of him arriving at Victoria Station with a suitcase wrapped up with string, you know. Did you actually say that, or have you got a different version of events? I think I said that. The rest of the story is not totally accurate, but that was, that was about right. <laughs> don't let it get in the way of a good story. <laughs> I, mind but you, I don't think I really did say that. <laughs> but you had your revenge, didn't you? Yes, because then I said, uh, can you ride? And she said, of course I can. I said, would you like to ride out tomorrow morning? And she said, yes. And I said, be in the yard at seven. So she came, she got on a horse. We got, went out for on Newmarket Heath, went off up a canter, and I saw her coming by, looking pretty on a horse. And, um, and then I was stand, uh, sitting on my hack, and then I look at towards the end of the canter and I spot some commotion. <laughs> so I ride up to there and there she is flapping her back. <laughs> So I looked down from my hack and said, hmm, I thought you said you could ride. <laughs> yeah, but the worst bit of it is you knew the horse had a habit of doing that at the end of the gallop. That's so mean. Well, I, the I horse fell over. Range. I keep on telling you, the, the horse, horse fell. fell over. I didn't yeah, that, fall off. Usually, the horse fell. Usually, it just that's stumbled that's and fell. That's what I say, team chasing. The horse slipped, you know, yeah. fell, on my, fell on the ground. And so anyway. I said, um, mm, I thought you could ride. You said you could ride, and uh, before she could say anything, I said, I'll pick you up next week and we'll go to, we'll go to a play in London. Oh. And so I went to pick her up, went to a play, and, uh, and it sort of started a bit from Was there. that the first and last time he's ever taken you out on a date in London? Yeah. <laughs> it sounds very out of character. <laughs> very out of character. Very out of character. <laughs> out of character. Yeah. Yeah, I think definitely exceptional <laughs> circumstances require exceptional <laughs> <action>. <laughs> <laughs> and then complacency sets in. Um, and I like, yeah, I like that kind of competitive nature to the beginning of the relationship. Was that a theme that's kind of carried on throughout the union? Still now, still now in theory. <laughs> yeah. we, we, there's no reason to compete at all, but it's, it's still very competitive. Yeah. Your mother, you know what she's like. She's just like you, very competitive. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not at all. No, no, no not, not at all. all. Not, not at all. Um, I would like to kind of go through your whole career, but I think there are lots of things external to the racing, what you've achieved as a racehorse trainer that are also almost more interesting. But just give us a few of your like personal highlights on the racetrack. Oh, I was very lucky. So uh, you have to probably go in stages and say that the milestones that happen. So the first was my first winner, which the Duke of York. Then it was my first Group 1, which was a horse called Old Country, appropriately winning the Italian Derby, which was my Old Country. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then next would be probably um, Tolomeo winning the Arlington Million, the first ever uh, English trained horse to win a million dollar race. And next would be Comanche Run winning the, and the Ledger, that, my first English classic. Uh, after that we go probably the derby with Kayazi and then the derby with, no, before, I, I think, no, the derby with Kayazi, then came Barathea in the, in the Breeders' Cup 
and probably then high rise in the next in the 98 derby then what I think was my very best horse the very best horse I ever trained was Palbrav came along in the early 2000s and um, yeah and the next big milestone was still being alive <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I think actually God Given was a bit of a milestone too. But it was a wonderful way to closing the chapter, last, last runner, and close the chapter. And yeah, no, no, yeah, it was a bit special that day was, too, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the last, the last runner was a Group One winner. Uh, again in Italy, so it's sort of full circle. Full circle. Started first Group One winner in Italy, last Group One winner in mm. Italy, and she was a wonderful mare called God Given. Um, yeah. And also, you're the last non-Japanese trainer to win. The Japan yeah. Cup? Apparently. Yeah. yeah. I don't think there'll be another well, one for quite a while it now. It was eh? in record time. I mean, yeah, it has at the time it was record, record, uh, record race in horse called yeah. Alka's head. And um, yeah, I think things have changed now with Japan because the Japanese, have, and thanks to the enormous investment they made into into their breeding operations, they yeah. now have much better horses. They've they become a then. bit too good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they sure have. And what's it like post training? What's life like now? Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it, on a day like this, in a place like this, uh, it is. It couldn't is be much worse. No, it's 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 um, it's something I always wanted to do. We started, Sarah, your mother and I started a, a, in a small way with a small stud in Chivoli, actually, next door village from here, in partnership with somebody who was only 50 acres. We only had about six, seven mares on that, and then we moved. We we bought 100 acres here. And then gradually, gradually, gradually expanded. Yeah, because that was a long time ago, wasn't it? You started 84, it. 84, 84. Wow. 1984, yeah. Practically my whole life span. Um, but what's been wonderful is that we've, we've, we've planned it all along and the plans come off. You know, mm -hmm. you don't, that's, you know, we, we had, we bought quite a few acres of just farmland, which we then had to fence and put grass, obviously trees, etc., etc. Planning eventually to have a house here. And it's all happened, which is yeah. amazing, really. And we all managed to do it before COVID, which is even more amazing. And what are we looking at now in terms of numbers of acres, numbers of horses? We're looking at 360 acres. And horses, I don't know, because the, 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 the numbers vary so often. Well, I was going to direct that to the boss. Sorry, you, you jumped in. But is, is, she, is she not the boss of this operation? <laughs> She's been my boss all her life. <laughs> at least she thinks so. <laughs> but actually, while you were training, it was more day to day, it was more your thing, wasn't it? And then now that you're both here, how, actually, how do you divide the responsibilities? Uh, it's always her. I, I mean, the, the idea is that the, she does the day-to-day -day, uh, dealings and I come in for the big decisions. But uh, ever since we started, I don't never seem to be in big decisions. <laughs> Not true at all. And so no, what does that very, involve? We very much have it, have it divided, I think. And I think... Um, when it comes to anything financial, it's definitely his... his yeah, numbers not your strong point, Number, are they? Numbers are not my strong point. No. Day-to-day uh, -day dealings, um, prepping yearnings for the sales, sorting what paddocks, you know, what horses go, what Sorry, paddocks... Paddock, paddock no, paddock <laughs> management is you. And, and also paddock movement. Well, it was sort of... Just, <laughs> bit, bit, Clearly bit, defined, bit, obviously. Bit <laughs> and then um, matings, with us and um, we've got a very good friend who helps us with our matings and so we do that very much together because I think there's a lot about the, the physical aspect as well as on paper what, what works but I think we we fairly we pretty much do that together don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have, I have to be kept say. on the straight and narrow because occasionally I want to go a bit off track but... Um, I know, you're, um, you're always telling me it's going to be a disaster when you're no longer with us. Well it could be. Luckily <laughs> <laughs> I won't be around to see you. <laughs> We will see, but so far things have all gone pretty well. They sure have. And in terms of involvement in racing post training outside the stud, what what do you what's your involvement now? Well, when I uh, when I stopped training and I moved here, I said to myself, I've been racing so many times, and uh, and, and so many times not in very comfortable situation. I said, well, from now on, I'll only go racing if I have a very smart invitation. <laughs> And that's what I've done. Or, or a very or good a runner. runner. Or, a, or a good runner, not too far away from Newmarket. And that's what we've done. <laughs> not, too, not outside Newmarket, basically. Yeah, yeah, we've been outside Newmarket. We've been to Asco, we've been to Kenton once, or places like that, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, like Haydock, it's not Haydock. Haydock, Haydock no, we've got to run out Haydock this weekend. It's a, it's a bit too far on a Saturday. Okay. Um, but BHA as well? BHA as well, yes. 
<laughs> Full stop. <laughs> not, not for much longer. BHA? Yeah. Oh, I don't know, for however long they Race, me. Are you enjoying so. the racing politics side of things? Uh, it's complicated. Okay. <laughs> not sure we're going to get much out of that, are we? Um, and then what's it like, uh, question more for you, raising a family in the environment of uh, a successful training, breeding operation as well? What's it like raising a family? Well, um, it's great. I mean, we we're wonderful. I mean, luckily, I had a bit of help. And I was always being Not pulled, pulled in different directions because he always wanted me to ride and ride the horses and I we had a monthly when you, you lot arrived and she was very unimpressed because every time I was meant to be feeding you two, he was saying, no, no, you've got to go and ride out. Oh, God. So, so that didn't go down very well. Um, but no, we, we managed to do everything together and you actually both went to boarding school. Which again, sort of, was convenient. <laughs> shipped <laughs> off. <laughs> shipped off. Yeah. It, it meant I could, you know, ride out and sort of be in, in, in with what was going on in the, um, in the yard. Were you surprised that both of your children ended up in the industry? No, I suppose when you when you grow up with it, it's sort of probably rammed down your throats. Although I, we never tried, we never sort of pushed you into it, did we? I mean, I remember you always were mustard keen to ride a racehorse, and actually Matty longed to ride, but he just kept on growing and got taller and taller and got too heavy. Um, but you always were very keen to ride, and I, I will always remember your first ever experience when you got totally taken off with. I remember and it ended too. Ended up in the Hamilton enough. Road yards, yeah. and being run away with. But yeah, and then I got a bollocking from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really mean. <laughs> Got taken off, with, ended up practically on the A14 or A11, which one everyone it is, down by the race course. Turned around and it did the same thing, ended up in someone's yard. <laughs> and then I got a bollocking, it's really fun. I'm not holding your horse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was only 12 at the time. It's amazing that I couldn't hold half a ton of thoroughbred. But you know, and what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. No, I think having, having you both involved was, was fun. It was great. Yeah, and now Matty's training in Australia. Was it always, were you, how do I phrase it? Had you envisaged him taking over from you here? Well, it was always so difficult because Matty started being ready to train way before I was ready to stop. And so the, that overlapping period, especially at the time when you, you didn't have joint licenses, and so it, it didn't really enter our mind that we could do it together because, it, the, as I said, there were no joint licenses. And, and that and, and that would, have been, it would have meant probably another 10 years of... Uh, of being together and, uh, and I, I didn't feel that it, it was the right thing to do and neither did Matty. So we explored the idea that he could start training by himself and uh, and we thought again that's tricky because well, he, uh, he only basically knew Newmarket and wanted to be in Newmarket and to have the two of us both in Newmarket taking each other on may not have been a very good idea. Uh, he then spent some time in America but wasn't particularly enthused with training in America. Then as we started having runners every year in the Melbourne Cup, um, Matty came to Australia and spent some time there. Then he spent some time with um, Chris Waller, spent a year, I think, working for Chris Waller. And then we came to the conclusion that uh, Australian racing is, 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 is thriving. It's the easiest environment to set up training. It's the easiest environment to find clients to have horses. And so we decided that that was the way to go. And, so Matty. And then he met, met and married an Australian, so it's sort mm. of cemented yeah. Yeah. being there. And, and just on a broader note, in terms of your world view on racing, what are your kind of predictions for the future? Who knows? How can you? <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> no, but you're, you're, you've already noticed, okay, Japan's getting stronger, Australia's a thriving industry, England's got its issues. How, if you had a crystal ball, what, what does it well, look like in 10 years' more time? More race courses. Uh, Saudi Arabia is going to build more race courses, and therefore will get stronger, and they obviously have a lot more money than, than people have in, in England. So, yes, it's tricky, but uh, England has the heritage, England has the knowledge, um, and uh, I'm sure that with, between England and Ireland we can still kind of carry on producing the best horses as long as we don't sell everything that's any good um, as long as we ha hang on to some um, some of the best horses and we still have good stallions and, and decent mares then we can carry on producing good horses the question is will there be a market for these horses as yearlings to reward the, tra the, the 
the breeders that produce these horses, and that entirely dependent on the, on whether prize money gets a bit better in this country, so that uh, nobody's advocating that anybody should make any money out of owning racehorses, but they just shouldn't be losing as much as they're losing at the moment. Mm, maybe syndicates are the way forward. Syndicates are very, very good, I think. <laughs> well said.